Hello and welcome. My name is Kathleen Ruddy. <clears throat> I'm the CEO of the St. Baldrick's Foundation, where we work with heroes for kids with cancer every day, and you're about to meet another one. Our guest today is Dr. Doug Hawkins. He's the group chair of the Children's Oncology Group, or COG, which is the world's largest organization devoted exclusively to childhood and adolescent cancer research. COG unites more than 10,000 experts in childhood cancer at more than 200 leading children's hospitals, universities, and cancer centers across North America, Australia, and New Zealand, all in the fight against childhood cancer. Dr. Hawkins is a clinician at Seattle Children's Hospital and professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He also chairs several international collaboratives aimed at Ewing and rhabdomyosarcoma research and data sharing. Dr. Hawkins, welcome. I am so happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, we're thrilled to have you. Now, I often refer to the COG, the Children's Oncology Group, as one of medicine's best kept secrets. I know that we wish that were not the case, um, but tell our audience, please, what the COG is and the important role it plays in childhood cancer research. Well, that's a great way of framing it. You know, the the all if you think about all the progress we've made over the last uh, decades, it's been from these large cooperative group studies that have brought together hundreds of institutions in order to conduct pivotal trials that lead to improvements in outcome. Um, and we couldn't do that without cooperation. Um, pediatric cancer is relatively rare. That's a good, th a good thing. That's about, it makes up about 16,000 cases of ch people less than 20 years of age in the United States every year. And the only way to run a clinical trial where you can really compare one treatment to another and learn which one is better and make improvements is with this cooperation across hundreds of hospitals. Um, that's a rare thing in medicine, to how pe have uh, people work together, put aside their egos, and realize that nobody's going to get a lot of credit, but by working together, we can run these studies that really demonstrate that one treatment is better than another, and incrementally, over time, continue to push up the cure rates for childhood cancer. We also are a mechanism to gather data across so many institutions and share it, as well as collect uh, tumor specimens and blood samples to make available to investigators all around the world. We have the largest biorepository of specimens from children with cancer anywhere in the world. And when someone wants to do a large study where you need access to hundreds or thousands of specimens, we're the place to go. And we make that available to people all around the world. So it, it, it's this cooperation, this pooling of resources that is what makes COG different than other organizations. And it's what, what has made all the difference in the last several decades. And what is accomplished in the countries where the COG is gets shared with others. And I think that's an important point a lot of people aren't aware of. So thank you for sharing that. About your member institutions, they are they are in five countries on three continents. So that's quite a diffuse army, and it takes a lot of different medical and scientific professionals um, to work together to save your patients, and yet your resources are very limited. How do you prioritize those scarce resources to make sure that needs of kids everywhere are well served? Well, I think you're right. We have an army, but it's a largely volunteer army. You know, we have um, nurses and pharmacists and physicians who make up our more than 10,000 members all across COG. Um, and they're mostly doing this because they're committed to the mission of improving the outcomes for children with cancer. But the, the resources are limited. Um, and so we have to prioritize what will be the most impactful studies we can do. Which are the studies that are likely to improve the survival rates for children? Which are the studies that will reduce the burden of, of short-term and long-term side effects? So we can't study everything. I wish we could. Um, we can't do studies or clinical trials for every disease, but we want to do as many as we possibly can in order and do the studies which are most likely to move the needle, to improve the outcomes for children, both their survival outcomes, but also their late effects outcomes. But in the meantime, we also need to collect some information about every child in order to um, have uh, data that can then drive the science that may lead to a future uh, study. So even though, even if we're not doing a clinical trial for a particular cancer, we need to make sure that we're studying at some level every cancer, collecting a little bit of information, biospecimens, blood samples, so that we can then use that for the work of discovery. So it's that combination of prioritizing the most impactful research, but also planning for the future when we have the opportunity to do a study to be uh, poised to do those studies for every child with cancer. So you talk about studies um, 
Another name for them is clinical trials, um, the main effort of the COG. I think those um, studies or trials often get a bad rap because people have so many misconceptions about them. Uh, but my understanding, and please tell me if this is right, is that in every trial, a patient receives the best known treatment or one that researchers have reason to believe might be a little better. Um, what would you say to people who are hesitant about participating in a trial and and how they have the potential to improve patient survival and quality of life? Well, I think that is a concern that so many families have. And I, uh, as you mentioned, I'm a clinician practicing oncology, and I've talked through with many families to have that initial discussion about your child has cancer and talking about treatment options. And in many cases, there is a clinical trial option and explaining that these clinical trial options are very well developed. There's a lot of thought that goes into them. And we never do a study where we think there's an arm that's going to be worse. We go into the studies and we have every reason to believe that one study, that all, that all the treatment arms are good. What we don't know is which one is better. And the only way we'll know which one is better is by doing the study. And as soon as we know that one arm is better, we'll stop the study, release the data, and allow everyone possible to switch over to the better treatment arm. Uh, but it takes some time to know that one arm is better than the other. But it's this process of doing studies where we compare one treatment to another. That's what we've been doing over the last uh, few decades. And that is exactly what's led to the improvements. That's where we've been able to demonstrate with, in convincing ways that we can change the standard of care, the way children are treated for cancer by doing these large studies. But there's so many safety features built into it to make sure that they're well designed, that they're monitored. And as soon as we know that one treatment is better than the other, that's when we stop the study, release the data and allow everyone to benefit from that study. I've heard um, research described as insidious incrementalism um, <laughs> because it's so painstakingly slow, but can you explain why that is so important to getting it right? I may borrow that phrase. I think that's a good phrase. Um, I didn't originate it, of yeah, course. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think um, some of COG's strengths are also our weaknesses. You know, we we are a combination of the uh, of the efforts and opinions of hundred to over two hundred institutions, thousands of members, and in order to move our studies forward, we need consensus. We may not get a consensus for ten thousand people, but we need a general consensus that we're going to commit to these studies and. Building consensus takes time. If we had a dictatorship, we'd move much faster, but we have a consensus built uh, organization. So to get everyone to agree, we need to have a general consensus. Uh, so that's our strength and our weakness. Um, our other strength and weakness is that we um, receive the majority of our funding from the National Cancer Institute. With that funding comes terms of the agreement, which includes review on a central level by the NCI of all of our studies. And this is another a level of scientific and patient safety uh, rigor. Um, and those steps of review take time. So it's good that we have some stable funding from the NCI, but that comes with, with obligations. And the obligations are more levels of scrutiny and review. Um, so. Uh, that does mean that when we launch, we may take a while to launch our studies. That's true because of all the consensus building, the levels of scientific review. But once we're ready to launch, we have a high level of confidence that we have the right question, that we have the, all the safety features built into it. So when studies are launched, when they're open, you can, anyone around the country can be very confident that this is a well thought out, this is the most pressing question to ask, and we are really committed to making this study happen. Well, and, the, and your studies that the COG tackles it is not the beginning of the research process. It's quite far along. I mean, there's a lot of basic science and translational work that makes the studies possible. Isn't that true? Oh, that's absolutely true. And that's, you know, when we when we write a study, we have we have long background that described the laboratory work that developed the study question, some of the early clinical work that decided, that proved that this drug was safe to use in children, the evidence that it might be effective, the studies in children who have recurrent disease. And then that all builds together for the evidence that we can launch a study that may involve 1,000 or 2,000 patients. So there's a lot of background. The data that goes in to launching a very large phase three study is, is years of laboratory work, sometimes on the institutional level, sometimes using specimens provided by the Children's Oncology Group, as well as our early phase clinical trials, and then the studies that lead up to our, our, our largest trials. So 
The first pediatric oncologist I ever met began his career just after World War II. And he had told me that the goal at that time was to get kids a couple weeks of life after diagnosis. And today, kids with some of the more commonly or more frequently occurring cancers have up to a 90% chance of survival for at least five years after diagnosis. So it shows a lot of progress in those post-World War II years to today. Um, but if you're ch a child with a more rare cancer, your prognosis may not be as favorable. How is the COG working to change that and what stands in your way? Yeah. Um, yesterday, I uh, introduced a speaker at our, my hospital honoring uh, Dr. Ron Chard, who was the, my mentor, who taught me everything about pediatric oncology more than 30 years ago. And he was an oncologist at the beginning when we first were developing effective treatment. And I remember asking him once, um, you know, what was it like to practice oncology you know, back when you started? And he kind of pulled down his glasses and looked at me over his glasses and he said, I was very good at writing condolence letters. And he saw the transformation during his career. He retired um, in around 2000. He saw the transformation from leukemia being a fatal disease to a disease where we can cure the vast majority. So that to me, I, I, did, I wasn't there at the beginning, but I talk with people like you did um, and know the transformation we've seen. And that's, so that's the positive story that, you know, if you look at all overall children with cancer, more than 80% will be alive after five years after diagnosis. That's great. And for certain diseases and ALLs, one of the great examples, we have a very high cure rate, but that's not the whole story because after five years, children continue to relapse and to die from their cancers. And a five-year survivor does not guarantee you 10-year and 15-year survivor. And so that's the first problem. The second problem is that's not true for all cancers. There are some cancers, DIPG, a common brain tumor in children, where we haven't moved the needle at all in 50 years. Despite all the progress in other cancers, we haven't changed the outcome for those children one bit. And then for the children who are cured, too many of them carry the burden of late effects from our treatment, such that they are experiencing severe, even life-threatening complications 20, 30, 40 years later. So we that's just unacceptable. We can't use five-year survival as our goal. We have to use the goal of restoring children to health for the rest of their life and a long life and without long-term side effects. Um, now, how we're going to get there is we're going to be studying our common cancers where we've made progress, and the goal is going to be how can we maybe reduce some of the burden of late effects? Can we pull back on treatment? Can we use smarter, more targeted therapies, some immunologically-based therapies? And that's the strategy we're taking in diseases like ALL and in Hodgkin lymphoma. For other diseases where we haven't made progress, we need to um, uh, muster all of the engine that's coming out of labs and early phase clinical trials to develop more novel treatments that can improve the survival for the children where we haven't improved outcome very much. And all of this has to be done with the lens of what is going to be the long-term burden of, of treatment that will that children who are survivors of childhood cancer will experience. So that's a tall order, but COG is the right organization to do that because we have access to hundreds of hospitals, because we can run these large studies, because we have access to these biospecimens, we're the group that can do this. We're the only group that can focus on the common cancers as well as the uncommon cancers to make big changes for all children with cancer. This is such incredible information and thank you for sharing all this. You know, we think about chemotherapy as medicine, but it's a killer. It's aimed at killing cells, something that's going on inside your body and that doesn't come without toxic side effects. And I think if you're an adult and you're 80 years old and you have cancer and you get something, a toxic treatment that may not manifest risks and late effects for 20 years, you're willing to accept that risk. But if you're six and you're getting it and it manifests in, you know, that toxic treatment manifests in 20 years or your body and mind are still developing you know, those on that onset of those late effects could happen much sooner. The risks are just unacceptable. So as you've said, so, so well put and a great rationale for why we need to invest more in pediatric research. Um, tell us please about the COG's high impact initiative and how it's helped fast track research. Yeah, I think this has been one of our best investments supported by St. Baldrick's Foundation. And um, we've launched this three times with St. Baldrick's support. Um, and the idea is this, that we have a lot of relatively small institutions who in aggregate 
make up more than half of our enrollments on studies. And when we open a study, um, some of them may worry that they may not see a patient with that diagnosis in the next two or three or four years. And so they may not choose to activate that study at their institution because there's costs associated with activating any study at their institution. So we have some studies that we think are really important, important. they're impactful, but they're at risk for slow accrual because um, institutions may decide this isn't common enough. This isn't worth our investment of the cost of opening the study. So we identify, we've done this uh, four times with St. Baldrick's support, or three times with St. Baldrick's support, and, and what we do is we identify four studies that we think fit that bill. They're impactful studies, but they're at risk for slow accrual. And we tell institutions, if you open up these four studies, and the next three months, we'll give you $10,000. And so it's a way of risk sharing, of, caught, of sharing the risk um, by providing the money that may allow those institutions to open up that study and giving them the incentive to open up the study in a very short time frame. And this has been amazingly effective. You know, when we've done this, we see the number of institutions with the study open go up by 90%, and we see accrual on those studies, uh, monthly accrual on those studies a year later is up by 97%. So first of all, we, we encourage, incentivize institutions to open up the study. And when they open up the study, we see enrollments go up dramatically. So this has been, uh, this high impact initiative has been one of the most impactful investments that we've received from St. Baldrick's Foundation. It really has transformed the timeline for getting these most impactful studies open and has allowed us to uh, provide the incentive and risk sharing with institutions to make the difference so that they feel empowered um, uh, to open up these studies. And, and then we see a dramatic change in the rate of enrollment on the studies. And I think there's a kind of a human um, element that's not measurable, but a benefit to the families, regardless of what their child's result is, their outcome um, from treatment knowing that they contributed to research to make things better for the next kids has got to be really empowering and a, a creator of hope for so many families. Oh, I, I completely agree. And I think we, um, we certainly say that when we talk about our biology studies or our registry studies, where we say, you know, we don't think you're going to, we actually know, we may know you're not going to benefit from being part of this registry study or, a, or allowing your your child's tumor sample to be banked for future research. But we can assure you that another child in the future will benefit because we're going to learn something. We're going to lead, we're going to be able to make an advancement. And the same thing with clinical trials. We don't know whether a child on an individual arm is going to have a better outcome because they're part of that study. But we can assure you that children five and 10 years in the future will receive better treatment because you were part of this study. And I think that um, for many families, that is such an impactful thing to do, to know that uh, as horrible as this moment is right now, that their child's been diagnosed with cancer. One of the things that many people say is, I don't want anyone else to have to go through this again. I want it to be better. And by being part of the studies that COG sponsors, we can assure you that children in the future will have a better outcome because of their participation. Yes. To our audience, if you're just joining us, we're speaking with Dr. Doug Hawkins, a pediatric oncologist from Seattle Children's Hospital and chair of the Children's Oncology Group, the world's largest organization devoted exclusively to childhood and adolescent cancer research. Dr. Hawkins, as we mentioned a moment ago, kids aren't little adults um, and their long-term risks are so much greater than for adults. Um, is this why childhood cancer is treated exclusively or at major research institutions? Well, I think it's um, th there is some expertise that's necessary to treat children because the risks, the types of complications um, are different. How we weigh um, the, uh, the benefits of a certain intervention, particularly radiation therapy or surgery, is very different for a child who has a lifetime ahead of them and with a lifetime of health or a lifetime to experience the side effects of treatment. Uh, I also think it's important to have access to some of the, the, the clinical trials in order to get the most information that may help guide a child's uh, care. Um, many children are treated at very large institutions, but many children are also treated at, at smaller institutions that are scattered across the United States. And uh, I think ha being part of the COD network allows those children, even if they're in a smaller institution or a medium-sized institution, to get access to some of the same expertise that a child might have if they live in a big city and go to a, to a larger institution. We want to make sure that uh, because 
uh, children with cancer are distributed geographically across the country. We want to make sure that everyone gets access to the same excellent care that's available through COG studies. Thank you for making that distinction because I think an important thing for our audience to know is that you're not likely to get much care at a community hospital You're taught for pediatric cancer, whereas um, diseases like prostate cancer and breast cancer are so ubiquitous mm -hmm. that you can find very effective treatment in mm -hmm. many more local um, based institutions. But children's hospitals um, and research institutions that are committed to that is really kind of the key for treating kids with cancer. These diseases, as you mentioned earlier, are more rare on the whole than adult cancers. Um, that rarity must make it very difficult to um, find the right treatment path sometimes for kids. I think that that's exactly true, and that's where you need the pooled resources that you can get from something like the Children's Oncology Group, where we can, um, where we publish our data about recent trials, so people understand that. Or even before the data are published, we share them at our meetings. Uh, we have uh, clinical protocols that are posted on our website, so our members can get access to our protocols and go back into some of the details about how specific medicines were given. So even if um, someone's at a um, uh, at a smaller program, they they can uh, understand. How to, how to treat children. But you're right. I think the, um, the bulk of care for children with cancer is done in the context we, um, of, of either clinical trials or uh, based on prior clinical trials. In fact, we estimate that about 90% of children with cancer in the United States are treated at COG institutions. That's very different than what happens in medical oncology, where most of the care for the common cancers, lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, will be treated at a community center. And it also is reflected by a much lower rate of enrollment on clinical trials compared to that seen in children. Mm -hmm. So many people, I think, measure progress against a disease in terms of new drugs, and that's their only measure of progress. But there are actually many types of advances that help improve survival and lower toxicity that are not necessarily a new drug. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those? Yeah, I think the you're right. We often think that it will be a novel agent that will lead to improvements. And in fact, many of our pivotal studies do look at a new drug, a more targeted agent improving the outcome for children with cancer. But if you think about some of the successes that have happened recently in COG studies, um, that either have led to uh, increased outcome or we could demonstrate that we could omit therapy, they have not involved targeted or novel therapies. One of the best examples is a study done by the Children's Oncology Group in high-risk neuroblastoma, children with metastatic neuroblastoma, where we ask a question of comparing one course of high-dose transplant therapy versus two courses of high-dose transplant therapy. There were no targeted agents used there. But the children who received two courses of high-dose therapy had an improvement in their event-free survival that was quite significant. That was published in JAMA um, two years ago. So that's an example where it wasn't a targeted therapy question, but it was asking a, um, a, a standard chemotherapy question where we saw an improvement in outcome. Recently on an ALL study, we asked a question about omitting courses of treatment of vincristine and dexamethasone during the long maintenance phase of therapies for children who had more favorable features. And what we showed was there was no difference in outcome, but by not having to come to the clinic every month, you know, at least two months out of, out of three, and not having to be on a course of steroid medicine, which most parents will tell you is not good for the behavior of their children and for other things too, um, we didn't see any reduction of, uh, uh, we didn't see any um, reduction of outcome, but we could see much less side effects in that arm. So that's a great example of how, uh, even without a targeted agent, we could, we could demonstrate from our large studies that we can remove standard therapies and have less long-term side effects effects or, or, or short-term side effects and, um, and yet uh, still move the needle. Uh, I, th I think an example where we actually saw a little bit of both was a recent study just published this year for children with relapsed leukemia, or ALL, uh, where we added a targeted agent in substitution for standard chemotherapy. And that study was stopped early because the targeted agent, lenitubumab, an immune-activating agent, um, was both more effective 
lower risk of recurrence, but also the side effects were way less. The, the acute side effects of treatment were much less. And this is a tr was a transformative study. It really changed the whole way we think about treating relapsed ALL because we could give a highly targeted therapy um, that had was both more, more effective but also had fewer side effects. So that's kind of like a home run to be able to have something that increases cure rate but also reduces the side effect of, of treatment. Well, and what that means is then the kids are not in the hospital as much. It eases burden on the healthcare system, long-term burden because they're healthier later after treatment. So they need less follow-up care. I mean, it, it's, it's, I would say it's not one home run. It's, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's a triple or something because yeah, that's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. And I think, well, it also raises new issues, which, you know, so this medicine is given as a continuous infusion. And uh, uh, if you can't figure out a way to do this, uh, as an outpatient, children have to be hospitalized. So we've learned how to partner with home healthcare agencies to allow this, these infusions to be given at home and for exactly the reason you raised, which is we want children to be at home, not in a hospital bed. And so that actually, we learned a lot about how we can do that, how we can partner, how we can change the healthcare system to allow delivery of care at home, which is everyone would choose as their care location rather than a hospital. Absolutely. So you mentioned earlier that the bulk of your funding comes from the taxpayer-supported National Cancer Institute. Anyone who pays scant attention to D.C. and what goes on there knows there's lots of competition for um, somewhat limited dollars. Um, yet the COG is the only pediatric cancer clinical trials group. Um, and you mentioned that there's some stability in your funding from NCI what is the process like where you have to go in and, if you will, compete for funding against other diseases, other um, adult consortiums, and so forth? Yeah, the process has evolved a little bit over time, but over the last uh, eight years, um, there have been four cooperative groups funded to support cancer research in adults and one for COG. And anyone can compete for these, but um, there is a comp. Uh, a competitive renewal every five and in, in this cycle will be six years uh, where we have to describe our success and what our plans are and justify the level of funding that we're requesting in order to run our cooperative group. Uh, in, in between years, we have to submit annual reports just describing what we're done, but the competitive renewal happens every five or six years. And with that, we're competing with the other cooperative groups to describe why why do we deserve the level of funding, the support from the National Cancer Institute based on our success and what our plans are? Um, and that in, uh, has, over the last few years, has uh, led to about 55 to $60 million of support annually from the NCI. The vast majority of that is used to support the research at institutions. So that's money that COG transfers to our member institutions uh, to help them with the cost of running clinical trials at their institutions. How has the pandemic impacted the COG's ability to open new trials? Yeah, I mean, I, I at the beginning, so I, I took over as COG chair in March of 2020, and as you may know, there are a lot of things happening in March of 2020. <laughs> so my timing, my timing was impeccable, <laughs> and I, I have to say, I was very worried about. Um, I was worried about a lot of things then, but I, I was really worried about what, how what this was going to be. You know, we are. Um, uh, offices have been remote since March 2020, so our staff located in Monrovia, California, have been working remotely, uh, even though we have a beautiful office that we don't use <laughs> now. Um, and uh, I worried that we just couldn't function, um, that our staff couldn't function uh, at the level we were doing before. I worried of the impact of the healthcare utilization that our institutions wouldn't be able to do the research. There was a dip in March and April in terms of enrollments on studies, but in 2021, we are enrolling more children on cancer clinical trials than we did in 2019. Wow. Um, and I, you know, I get month, I get weekly updates and I look at the data, I try to aggregate data on a quarterly basis. We are enrolling more children on our clinical trials now than we were in 2019. And I think that's a testament to the dedication of oncologists and nurses and pharmacists, everyone who's part of the CG network all across the network to the importance of our clinical trials. And since the onset of the pandemic, we've activated 19 clinical trials 
since March of 2020. So we actually have, um, in 2021, we are opening as many studies as we were before. It hasn't slowed us down. It's kind of amazing, but I think it, it talks, it, it speaks to the dedication of our operations team that despite working remotely, despite doing all of our work by Zoom or, you know, other, other uh, remote connections, we're able to open up if not the same, more studies, and certainly we are enrolling and treating more children on our studies than we were prior to the pandemic. And it also underscores that while we all work to overcome COVID, we can't lose sight of everything else that needs to be cured and overcome as well. Um, what do you foresee for the COG over the next 10 years or so? Yeah, I'm terrible at crystal ball uh, predictions, but I, there's a few things I'm pretty excited about. You know, I, I think... Um, uh, what, what we've learned that it's certainly possible to, we have the technology now to get a very comprehensive picture of the molecular signature of an individual tumor, um, of all the DNA changes, the changes in, in how um, DNA is regulated. Um, and we can do that. It used to be very expensive. It's still pretty expensive, but it's scalable. Um, what we haven't been able to do is to make that technology available to all children across the United States. Uh, if you go to a large institution, we have an institution which has separate funding, they can do a pretty comprehensive battery of molecular testing. And the reason this is so important is that some of our molecular, uh, uh, some of our therapies are, will be dependent on the presence of a molecular marker. And if you don't know that your child's cancer has that marker, you'll never know you need to use a special targeted therapy. And in some cases, the diagnosis is dependent on having a molecular signature. And if your institution, if child's treated an institution that doesn't have access to that, they'll nev we'll never know about how to mm -hmm. precisely diagnose their cancer and what's the best targeted therapy, if there is one, for their child. So again, this is, in many ways, this is a, 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 an issue of equity. Of how can we make sure that this sort of testing is available to all children, regardless of where they're treated, not just those children treated at the biggest institutions. And so in partnership, with the National Cancer Institute and using funding from the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, we're going to launch um, the molecular characterization protocol um, by the end of this year, beginning of next year. And what this is going to do is we're going to, um, through our biobanking study called Project Every Child, we're going to obtain consent to collect tumor samples and blood from children. Um, we're going to send it to our biobank in Ohio. It's going to be extracted. We're going to bank away the, the material for future research. And then we're going to have it analyzed at a central vendor, which happens to also be in Columbus, Ohio, called um, uh, IGM. And within two weeks of receipt of the material, they're going to generate a clinical report with a very comprehensive profile of the changes in the DNA, in the tumor, and in the blood, germline changes, the changes that we see in the RNA, biofusion analysis, and also DNA methylation analysis. This will be the most comprehensive panel that is clinically available anywhere. And we're going to return those results to the treating physician and patients within two weeks of receipt of adequate material. And that's it for, we're going to start with brain tumors. We're going to next going to roll it out to soft tissue sarcomas, and then we're going to roll it out to, to rare tumors. So it's not all children with cancer, but that's a large proportion of children with cancer in the United States. And we're going to be able to make this available in other countries too, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And we think we're, we're planning to do this for about 3,000 children per year. Uh, if we can do this, uh, we're going to transform both the diagnosis and treatment of kids with at least those selected uh, diseases all across the network. And we're going to develop a bank of, of data that's going to be an unparalleled treasure trove of genomic data that can be mined by investigators all around the world to understand the genetic underpinnings of pediatric cancer. So this is pretty audacious, I got to tell you. I, I, there, there have been times I've woken up in the middle of the night worrying, can we really pull this off? I mean, this is, this is phenomenal to be able to pull this off, not just at one hospital, but 220 institutions all around the world. It's going to be unbelievable if you can do it. But it's going to be transformative in terms of the access to all children with cancer, at least these selected types of cancer, regardless of where they live. Um, so that's something I'm very excited about because I think it's really going to change how we think about diagnosing and, and treating children with cancer. The other thing I'm really excited about is um, our new version of the pediatric match. So the pediatric match was a study where we, for children who had recurrent cancer, we would obtain, ask them to, to uh, obtain tumor samples, send it to a central bank where we do testing and identify whether there was a molecular marker that might allow them to have
Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've lost Dr. Hawkins. Um, and we'll try and get him back another time because that molecular characterization protocol and the pediatric match. Oh, you're back. Dr. I don't know Hawkins, what happened. I have no idea what happened. Sorry about that. So I was talking about the I was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> pandemic problem, right? So I um, uh, I was talking about the pediatric match. And, and so that we've all enrolled over 1,300 children. We've assigned uh, over 130 children to a specific targeted therapy because of that. And now we're planning for the next generation of that. And we're going to be able to roll this out, not just to sites in the United States, but to other countries, including Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And then we're going to continue some of the arms that have not finished. And so we'll be able to make this, this study available with targeted therapy to go on beyond into 2022. So I think that's really exciting. We're already planning the next phase where we're going to look at combinations of drugs called the combo match. So I think for me, that's how we're going to try to bring the drugs that are highly targeted into children and make them available to children all across the network, whether they're at a big institution or a small and medium-sized institution. This is incredibly exciting stuff, and we've just scratched the surface. I know I would love to hear more about the pediatric match and the molecular characterization protocol. Did correct. You got it. You got it. Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, it, this is huge because data sharing is really um, one of the keys to mm -hmm. accelerating and fast tracking more progress and enabling kids not to be left behind and to make sure that we're making progress against those more difficult diseases to treat diseases. So I'm going to put you on the spot and say, would you be willing to come back and talk with us more about those initiatives? Uh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, the partnership that COG has had with St. Baldrick's is, is our most important philanthropic relationship. You know, we, I, COG <laughs> could not have accomplished what it's done over the last 15 plus years without the support of St. Baldrick's. You know, you are absolutely essential to our mission. We, our members, you know, the member institutions love this, uh, love uh, St. Baldrick's and the support they receive. You're, you're critical to us. And uh, you, you, if you invite me back, I'll be there. I will try not to be injured before I come back next time, but I, I will be there. Well, thank you. You're a trooper for being here. Thank you so much for all your leadership and to all your member institutions and, and the individuals at those institutions for being so dedicated every day to our kids. And to you and our audience, Halloween is just days away. And remember, there's nothing more frightening than a child being diagnosed with cancer. So please share this episode on your social media so others can learn about the important work of the Children's Oncology Group. And don't miss our next episode of the Impact Series on November 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 Pacific, when we speak with Bill Pack, father of Marley and president of Marley Smile. Bye for now.